pending question this offseason for Boston has been, where will Josh Winkowski be used? Find out more on today's Locked on Red Sox. You are Locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbutt former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast. And I am here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox, Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed for free. And honestly, who doesn't love free? I mean, might as well take advantage of it, right? So start your day off the right way by listening to Lockdown Red Sox, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWN for $20 off your first purchase. Hello and welcome to another episode of the show. I hope you're having a great day, great week. Um, it was a little rainy here in Connecticut. I don't know about all of you, uh, but it's been a little bit annoying because it's actually been a pretty warm week so far so to get some rain mixed in has definitely been a little bit frustrating but nevertheless spring is right around the corner and i can't wait and today's show is about some things related to spring training how did josh winkowski look in his outing other things related to the team performance on wednesday but first It is with an absolutely heavy heart that I have to say that Tim Wakefield's family is in my thoughts. Tragically, his wife, Stacy, passed away on Wednesday after a battle with pancreatic cancer. She passed away in her home in Massachusetts, surrounded by her family, her nurses, and a bunch of loved ones. And I just can't fathom how that happens to a family like that. I mean, the Wakefield kids having to deal with the loss of their father less than five months ago and now dealing with the loss of their mom, it's truly heartbreaking. There are really not words to describe this feeling Um, I can't even begin to relate to what they're going through. Um, They are in my thoughts. It's just, it's so unfortunate because it could not have, you know, happened to better people. I mean, they were just truly so full of love, just loved the sport of baseball. Wake just gave everything he had to the game and was a true advocate for raising money for childhood cancer and just did so much off the field for Boston. And Stacy was just a true representation of the baseball community and being supportive and embracing Boston. And it's really, truly sad. So I'm asking you to please take a moment to just keep the Wakefields in your thoughts, and here's a moment of silence in honor of Stacy. Thank you. It's awful. It's really awful, and I'm sending my thoughts and prayers to the entire Wakefield family. The Boston Red Sox are in the midst of spring training games, and they had a rough 4-3 to three loss versus the Nationals on Wednesday after coming off of a tie 3-3 three to three against the Cardinals on Tuesday. And, you know, it happens. A lot of these prospects are still trying to feel out their spot on the team, where they're going to play, how they're going to contribute, and it's hard to really tell who the major contributors are going to be. But one player who all offseason has been talked about as 
somebody who could potentially be a starter for Boston in 2024, even though he's basically spent the majority of his time in the bullpen, is Josh Winkowski. And he made an appearance on Wednesday in the game versus the Nationals. He pitched two innings, gave up zero runs, one walk and struck out one batter. So that's good. He looked very good. Nothing to really be too concerned about. A couple pretty quick innings for him. Didn't really get himself into jams, but again, only pitched two innings. And that's been a pattern with a lot of these Red Sox pitchers is they're only pitching one to two innings at a time. And it makes sense because they don't want pitchers to overwork during spring training and not be able to pitch as well during the season. So I don't mind that at all. And the thing with Josh Winkowski is he was super dominant out of the bullpen last year. He pitched to a 288 ERA with a 4-4 four and four record, recorded three saves, and struck out 82 batters over 84.1 innings pitched. He did come into a lot of big high leverage situations and was able to get the job done and recorded some saves, came in with the bases loaded and was able to get out of it. And his little on-field celebration after every outing in which he got out of a jam was legendary. So I really like watching him pitch, but the question more for me is, can he be a starter? Now that tends to be the question. I mean, he showed a ton of improvement from 2022 to 2023. For example, he cut his ERA in half. It went from a 5.89 to a 2.88, which is absolutely commendable. He was a little unlucky in 2022 and was luckier in 2023, but still improved from a 4.95 FIP to a 3.91 FIP. FIP stands for Fielding Independent Pitching, and it's similar to ERA, but it basically only focuses on the events a pitcher has the most control over, so primarily strikeouts, walks, hit-by-pitches, and home runs. It entirely removes results on balls hit into the field of play. So, for example, if a pitcher has surrendered a high average on balls in play, his FIP will likely be lower than his ERA. Balls in play are not part of the FIP equation because a pitcher is believed to have limited control over their outcome. So it basically filters out the other scenarios and basically only takes scenarios in which the pitcher himself has the most control over. So that improved from 2022 to 2023, which is also a promising sign. He struck out 82 batters in 84 and a third innings which was an enormous climb to the tune of 3.12 more Ks per nine innings than he tallied in 2022. And like I mentioned, when the game needed securing, it was a pretty standard procedure of Alex Cora's to bring Wink in at some point, likely during the seventh inning, before then turning to Chris Martin and Kenley Jansen. That was typically the order. So he was called upon in high leverage situations. Among the most notable of his strengths, though, is his ability to basically adjust to what's working, primarily his cutter. In 2022, his cutter was his best pitch, which yielded a 211 batting average, a 30% whiff rate, and a run value of two. But the only issue was he only went to it 11% of the time. So in 2023, he was able to adjust to that and triple his usage of his cutter and kept opposing hitters guessing. So he's able to adapt on the fly and as the season progresses, which is a good quality for a starting pitcher to have. What I'm concerned about, though, is that his strikeout rate isn't quite where it needs to be yet, and he does struggle with walks. In 2023, in high leverage situations, he averaged 3.72 walks per nine inning and 8.38 strikeouts per nine innings. So his walk to strikeout ratio was, he was basically striking out about 2.25 hitters to every walk that he gave up. With the bases empty, he was averaging about 8.49 strikeouts and 2.83 walks. So 
he definitely needs to change that ratio a little bit and separate them a little bit more, start striking out more guys and walking less guys. Um, when there were men in scoring position, he did get into a situation where he was averaging about four walks per nine innings in those scenarios. So whatever it is, it might be a mental thing. Maybe he gets nervous when there's runners on and he needs to figure out a better way to mentally calm himself down, but he tends to lose control when there's runners in scoring position and walks more guys then. So that would be my concern with him is can he start to strike out more hitters and can he walk less guys? Because he's going to struggle as a starter if he can't do those things. But the fact that he's able to adapt and learn quickly shows that he has the characteristics to be able to succeed as a starter. It's just a matter of, does it make sense to make him a starter? And only time will tell. But coming up, the Red Sox have an interesting outfield situation right now. And the pending question is, what will happen with it? You'll find out more next. Are you ever in a rut and looking for last minute tickets? If so, game time is the place for you. I've had so much success with it. There have been multiple times where I've bought concert tickets or basketball game tickets using game time. It gives you last minute tickets at the best prices and you can see where you're sitting. It shows you a seating chart with your view of the stage or the court if it's a basketball game or whatever the sporting event may be. And you can see what your view is going to look like so you can be reassured that you're getting a good view. It's not like you're purchasing tickets at Fenway Park and not knowing you're going to be stuck behind one of those green poles the whole time and not be able to see. That's the worst view. So game time will give you reassurance that you'll have the angle and view that you're looking for. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDON for $20 off. Download GameTime today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. GameTime is awesome and I highly recommend you checking it out. You also should check out Locked On Sports Today, which is available on both YouTube and Amazon Fire TV. Basically, what it does is it gives you the latest in all things sports in a stream that we have from all of our experts of Locked On. So you don't have to worry about missing anything going on in sports. Just check out Locked On Sports today on either YouTube or Amazon Fire TV. And no matter what time zone you are in, you'll get caught up in everything going on in sports. The Red Sox have two outfielders in William Abreu and Sadon Raffaella who are very much fighting for roster spots this spring on a team that is truly trying to figure out their outfield situation still and who's going to play there, who's going to be on the opening day roster and what makes sense. And both of these players showed some major potential in 2023. William Abreu took 76 at-bats at the major league level last year and recorded a 316 batting average. Sadam Raffaella took 83 at-bats and recorded a 241 average. So they definitely both showed some promise. And the question now becomes, which one is going to be a better fit in the Red Sox outfield? One thing Raffaella has going for him is that he's more versatile. He can play in the infield and the outfield. I anticipate that the Red Sox will utilize him more in the outfield, but it's good to know that for reassurance purposes, he can also play in the infield in case there's an injury or some other scenario with a player that's playing in the infield. So Raffaella is definitely showing some promise from that standpoint, but also during spring training. He's definitely winning the battle as of right now. In Tuesday's 3-3 tie game against the Cardinals, Raffaella went 1-2. for two. He did record a hit in that game, so that was a plus for him. And then William Abreu went 0-1. for 1. So they both didn't take a ton of at-bats, but Raffaella made something happen 
with one of his at-bats, and Abreu didn't necessarily do that. So then you go to Wednesday's game against the Nationals, which the Red Sox lost 4-3, to and Rafaela went one for two again and drove in a run. He recorded an RBI and also drew a walk, and then he did strike out one time, but the fact that he was able to battle and get walked and then also record a hit and drive in a run is key. And then Willier Abreu went 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. So he really is not seeing the ball well at all right now. And again, it's still early. It's spring training. This could change. He has time to adjust what he's doing and figure it out before the season starts. But if you're taking this at face value for what it is and you're looking at both Abreu and Rafaela right now, Rafaela is looking like the better choice to make the opening day roster. Abreu is in danger of starting the season in AAA. One of them will, or maybe the Red Sox look to trade one of them at some point if they're looking for some pitching help or reinforcements in other areas because they have a lot of outfielders. I mean, if they do move Yoshida to more of a full-time DH, which does make a lot of sense in the grand scheme of things. Then they're looking at a scenario where Tyler O'Neill will be out there, Jaron Duran will be out there, and then likely either Abreu or Rafaela as the other starting outfielder. And then you have Rep Snyder, who is more of a utility player who can play both in the infield and the outfield, but spends a lot more of his time in the outfield. So he would likely be the other guy who's the swing player and isn't playing every day, but is there especially to hit against lefties because that's totally his thing. So that becomes a question. Do you need to keep both Abreu and Rafaela? The chances are likely not. And this is the season for them both to be able to showcase what they have in order to prove that they deserve a long-term roster spot. And the problem is going to become whatever one doesn't make the roster is not going to have that time to showcase what they have. So then if the Red Sox did want to trade them, they wouldn't have as high of a value. So the Red Sox wouldn't be able to get as good of a return. So Abreu struggling right now in spring training is a tough sign. I like to think that He'll fix that as the next month or so progresses before opening day. And it's because he's getting himself reacclimated to seeing live pitching and being in a baseball type of setting because the off season can be long for players. I mean, they don't take too much time off, but they do take a break. And so he went from playing baseball every day to not playing baseball for a little while. It's natural to have a little hiccup and have to pick yourself back up and get back on pace to where you want to be. So hopefully that fixes itself for him because he did produce in his short stint in 2023 more so than Rafaela did. And that makes you wonder at the major league level with more pressure, does he thrive? Is that the type of environment that he's better in? In which case then he'd be a good fit to be in the starting outfield come opening day. Does Rafaela not know how to handle that pressure as much of playing at the major league level, or is it just a matter of time for him? So there are still a lot of questions to be asked when it comes to these two right now, but based on what we've seen so far in spring training, Sadam Rafaela is making a very strong case for himself for why he should make the opening day roster. And being able to play infield and outfield positions only gives him a leg up from Abreu. So if Abreu wants that chance to be in the starting outfield, he has to really step up a lot more over the next month. Or I could see the Red Sox either keeping him in AAA and have him linger in case there's an injury or something and he needs to come fill in. Or maybe they DFA him and give him an opportunity to go elsewhere and succeed there. But if the Red Sox didn't have the specific outfield situation that they have, it wouldn't be as big of a deal for him. He would feel a little bit more secure probably knowing that he has a spot. But that's just not the case. The outfielders have to work extra hard to prove themselves and prove they have a spot. Tyler O'Neill is pretty guaranteed a spot, I would say, because his defense has been standout since he got here for spring training 
and the Red Sox traded for him, so they definitely see value in him, and they need that defense. And Abreu has shown some glimpses. He had some good plays in the outfield last year when he did come up to the majors in the last month of the season, but still not a big enough sample size to be able to conclude that that's who he is as a player. I mean, what if he just was on a hot streak when he came up and he overperformed and he's going to jump back down to reality and reality is just an average player who isn't as good and Red Sox fans wouldn't be as pleased about. So that's the pending question with him right now. Will Will your Abreu or Sadam Rafaela end up on the opening roster? My guess is that one of them will, one of them will not, but only time will tell and their performances throughout the rest of spring training. So keep an eye on those two over the next month or so. It might be a battle. Coming up, we have 28 days until opening day, and somebody who was pretty special to Boston wore uniform number 28, so I'm going to be revealing that next. Are you a huge fan of sports betting? I've never personally been super into it, but my fiance is, and he's gotten so addicted to it, and he has a lot of fun with FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. My fiance has so much fun with this app. It really does give you lots of different ways to win money and lots of different sports to bet on. So head to that today if you're looking to win some big money. You should also head to Locked On Sports today, which is available on both YouTube and Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app as Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Lockdown Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. This is super exciting for the network because nobody else has this. We are the only network to have a live streaming service 24-7. So if you're looking to keep up on all things sports and don't want to constantly be scrolling through Twitter, Lockdown Sports Today is the place for you. We are getting closer and closer to opening day. We are now under 30 days away, which is crazy. It's going to fly by, and it helps that February is a short month. We do have an extra day in February this year, so happy leap day to all who celebrate as it is February 29th. But in general, with February being a short month, it makes it feel like it goes by a lot faster and it's closer. So 28 days remain. And who wore number 28 in Boston? Well, one player who was key that did and helped the Red Sox fuel a championship run in 2018 was J.D. Martinez. I mean, talk about a hitting savant. He was absolutely the missing piece that the Red Sox needed to win it all in 2018. In that season, he took 569 at-bats over 150 games played. He scored 11 runs, recorded 188 hits, 130 RBIs, and took 69 walks while striking out only 146 times. He also finished with a 330 batting average. And on top of all of that, he hit 43 home runs. So if you take a season where you hit 43 home runs, 130 RBIs, and you're scoring a lot of runs, and you have an on-base percentage as good as his was, which is 330, and an on-base percentage of 402, as well as a slugging percentage of 629. That man was a machine in 2018. He also hit 37 doubles in all of this, so he was able to diversify his hitting significantly. He wasn't just hitting home runs, but 
he was hitting for contact and getting himself on base and hitting a lot of doubles. But there is no shame in a season of 43 home runs and 130 RBIs with a 330 batting average. I mean, he was on pace to potentially win the Triple Crown that year for the American League. He almost won MVP, but came up short to his teammate at the time, Mookie Betts. I mean, talk about a fun year for the Boston Red Sox and a fun year for J.D. No pitcher wanted to go up against him that year. On September 4th, 2017, Martinez became the 18th player in MLB history to hit four home runs in a single game, doing so versus the Dodgers. During the Red Sox 2018 World Series run, he won the AL Hank Aaron Award as the league's top offensive performer, leading the league in RBIs while placing second in batting average and home runs. He also won the 2018 Player's Choice Award for Player of the Year. I mean, this guy has so many career accolades, and it was so fun to watch him play Three-time Silver Slugger, six-time All-Star, and 2018 World Series champion. I mean, I miss those days of the Boston Red Sox when they just had an absolute powerhouse. That 2018 team just did not lose. Just did not lose. It was crazy. They always found a way to come back in games just when you thought that they were going to lose and the game was over, they would find a way to climb back in. That team was so special, and he was at the heart of all of that. On February 26th, 2018, was when he signed a five-year, $110 million contract with the Red Sox. On April 7th, he hit his first home run in a Red Sox uniform at Fenway Park, doing so off Chaz Rowe of the Tampa Bay Rays. Martinez won the AL Player of the Week award for the week ending on May 20th, after hitting five home runs, eight RBIs, a 346 average, and a 1.414 OPS in seven games. If you're on base percentage plus slugging is over 1,000, it's pretty crazy. At that point, he had tied with teammate Mookie Betts for the Major League home run lead at 15, making them the first duo in Red Sox history to both hit at least 15 home runs within the first 50 games of the season. Martinez set the franchise record for home runs through the month of June, hitting his 25th on June 28th versus Andrew Heaney of the Los Angeles Angels. The previous record of 24 had been achieved by Ted Williams in 1950, Mo Vaughn in 1996, Jose Canseco in 1996, and Manny Ramirez in 2001. I mean, talk about craziness. Batting 329 with 27 home runs and 73 RBIs, Martinez was named to the 2018 MLB All-Star Game as the AL starting designated hitter. Spanning one full season of play from the 2017 All-Star Game to July 14, 2018, he led the majors in home runs with 60, RBIs with 152, and OPS in 1.074. In a 19-12 win over the Baltimore Orioles on August 10th, Martinez became the first player to reach 100 RBIs in the 2018 MLB season. He again won the AL Player of the Week award for the week ending August 12th when he hit 464 with 11 RBIs and 9 extra base hits. He was also recognized as the AL Player of the Month for August with a slash line of 373, 453, 686 with seven home runs and 25 RBIs in 26 games. The craziest thing about JD to me was that he never slowed down. He constantly was dominating that entire 2018 season and opposing pitchers legitimately feared him all year long. Never had slumps, never didn't hit well. He was constantly doing something productive where you knew that he was going to cause some damage one way or the other. And he was a great DH for this team. And I felt confident all the time with him coming up to the plate, similar to when I felt confident in Justin Turner coming up to the plate last year. JD was a designated DH. He was a true DH that the Red Sox brought in to win that World Series, and it just worked out so well for Boston. He was a great addition, and the Red Sox obviously won so many games that year. 108 games during the regular season is just absolutely nuts, and Everybody knew that no other teams had a chance in the postseason that year. The Red Sox were winning it all, and that just was what it was. I mean, 
Houston was the team that made me the most nervous. But once they got by the Astros, I was like, okay, yeah, this team's not losing. The Dodgers are not beating the Red Sox. The Red Sox just looked like the best team in baseball that year. And they were. In reality, at the end of the day, they were. And J.D. loved playing in Boston. You could tell that he was super excited every time he did something well during the 2018 season. Celebrated so much when they won the World Series. Just a really fun year all around with lots of good vibes. And J.D. was a huge part of those vibes. So great memories of J.D. Martinez playing in Boston. The best player to wear number 28 for the Boston Red Sox. And I miss him a lot. And I don't really blame him for going to the Dodgers when he did. They wanted him. The Red Sox weren't interested. So it was what it was. But I'm wishing him nothing but success. They don't win that World Series without him. And those numbers he was putting up were just unbelievable. As always, Red Sox fans, we are so close. Opening day is almost here. As always, keep the faith. Go Red Sox. And I will catch you on the flip side.